what the scriptures had to say on this matter regarding women and certain limitations that were placed on them. They were understood, they were accepted as coming from God. All that has changed in our society today with women seeking to have leadership positions within the church. And I guess the question that rises, how do we make sense of it all? Can the issue be settled by what is politically correct at the time? Or do we base it on whether we like it or dislike it? Or simply because it's being done in other churches and denominations? Personally, I believe that this issue can be settled by what the scriptures have to say. Let the scriptures speak for themselves. Now the push and agenda of the feminist movement has and continues to have an influence on the church today. Many are told and feel that if they do not have the same equality in the church that men do, then they're considered second rate, that they're inferior to men, that they should have the same rights and privileges because after all, all Christians are the same in God's eyes. And that's the argument that's put forward. I don't believe that that's a correct view. As we will look at this passage, I think what it comes down to is understanding what our roles and responsibilities and function is to be as men and women, as defined by God. And this what I, is what I believe is important. What does God have to say on these matters? It's not a matter of what I have to say. It's not a matter of what some commentator has to say. It's what does God have to say on these matters? And can we know what God has to say? Or do we have to interpret it for him? And so we're going to start our journey tonight in looking at these verses. The first thing we have in verses 9 and 10, Likewise, the women are to dress in suitable apparel with modesty and self-control. Their adornment must not be with braided hair and gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but with good deeds as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. So tonight we're just looking at one thought, the appearance. The appearance. And the first thing he does, or what I'm doing is cutting it up in little pieces, is a command. It's a command, it's not an optional extra. In verse 8, which we looked at where Paul was dealing with men in the church, failing to take their responsibility of coming forward and providing leadership in praying for the lost, he made it very plain that his command was for the men to take this position and to pray in the church. And it says here that um, in this verse, he is putting his attention to how women would approach worship in the church. And I've looked at all of the pros and cons that have been presented here, and they're saying, well, Paul is talking to Timothy about false teachers, and there were no false teachers among the women here. But if you look at what he's talking about, it's the attitude of people coming to worship together. He's talking about men who were arguing and fighting and in, in dissension with one another. He said that has to come together and they have to lead by example. And he's talking here that women must come, how they must come and approach. And he used the word buleme. And it's referring to his purpose, his determination, his command for addressing this issue. It's not some optional extra. It's not his wish. I wish you would do this. I think you ought to do this. He's saying this is what you should do. It's not optional extra. If it had been that, he would have used the Greek word fellow, and he doesn't. He uses this boleme which means this is my command to you as a people in the church. When you come together to worship, this is what I'm commanding you. This is what I'm instructing you. So he's asserting his authority. He's saying 
People, I want you to pay attention to what I have to say here. Just as I've commanded men to lift up holy hands in prayer, I now command women to demonstrate modesty and spiritual uh, adornment in their worship in the church. This is what I'm commanding you. I'm not asking your opinion. I'm not asking for an argument. I'm not asking you to consider whether you think I should be saying this or not. I'm telling you. So there's a command, likewise. It goes back to the previous verse. Then a concern. The women are to dress in suitable apparel. Now Paul, when we look at this, we sort of can skate over the top of it. But Paul is making an important statement. Here he's expressing a genuine concern for what is happening when the church gathers together to worship. And in verse 8, which is the previous verse, Paul addressed the issue of gender by a word that he used to indicate that he was speaking to male men. He used the word aneur, and that is to men in gender. It wasn't to females, it was for men. He didn't use the word for mankind, which would have included males and females. He was speaking definitely to all the male gender. He commanded them to take the leadership role in praying in the church. There's no two ways about it. I'm telling you, this is what you should do. In verse 9, he's making it plain that he's speaking to the female gender. He uses the word gynecus, and we get that word gynecology in our English but gynecus, and it refers to the female gender. There's no ifs, buts, or whatever. And this is important, particularly as what we're seeing is happening in our society today, where the lies are being blurred by gender fluidity. The cancel culture wants us to rewrite what they don't like or agree with. In other words, Get rid of personal pronouns. They must be ambiguous. We can never use them or they. We can use those, but we can never use him or her. They are not acceptable as they might offend someone who considers themselves to be a female or a male. So what Paul is saying here is important. He's addressing the female gender. He's not giving it as a general for the whole congregation. He is addressing and commanding the female gender. Keep in mind, Paul is dealing with corporate worship. Men who were having anger and dissension issues within the church when it came to praying. And now Paul addresses the issue here of women in worship saying they need to be appropriately dressed. The word cosmeo. You can imagine cosmeta, cosmetics, we get the similar sorts of thing. Mean to adorn, to put on, to arrange. It covers the outerwear, the things they physically wear, as well as the attitude of their heart when they come to worship. In other words, when women come together in corporate worship, they are to wear proper or respectable clothing in what they dress. Paul is not saying... And he's not saying, women, you can't use makeup, or that they're not allowed to do their hair, but they are to dress in a way that is proper and appropriate when in mixed company. Now, please understand, as we will find out, Paul is not a killjoy. He's not a fashion policeman. He's not against wearing jewelry or expensive clothing. He is simply instructing women to come to worship in a way that's respectable and would honour the law. That is his concern and that's what he's addressing. We come to the word control with modesty and self-control. And I found this old picture and we can laugh at that. How many would like to be dressed like that? I can remember in those days. All right? But you notice there that they're all appropriately dressed in modesty. 
Paul uses the word abios, which means modesty. And it means that a woman is to play or pay particular attention to her clothing to make sure that it will not be inappropriate and bring her or give her a sense of shame by what she wears. It's asking women to pay attention to the clothes that they wear when they worship. Do not be in any way a source of temptation. Do not be in any way a source of distraction for others who will come to worship. Not only does she apply this principle to situations of worship, but Paul is saying apply it to every sphere of her life. She will take the appropriate steps to be modest and discreet in everything she does. She will not desire to be an object of lust. She will not be the object or eye candy, as some have called it, and will do everything within her power to make sure that she doesn't do anything that would dishonor or offend God or be a stumbling block because of what she wears when she comes to worship. Paul's main concern is not with, if you like, okay, ladies, come here, I've got a tape measure, I'm going to measure your hemline. That's not what he's saying. What Paul is concerned is about holiness. He is addressing or challenging their priorities. What's the reason for you doing what you're doing and wearing what you're wearing? Is it based on outward appearances or does it flow from the inward attitude of your heart? Is that reflected in the way you dress? He then uses the word sofrason and it means moderation or literally it means to exercise self-control. The challenge is to think about what you're wearing and how that will affect others when you worship. Does it distract? Does it take away from honouring the Lord in worship? Self-control, restraint, moderation for the purpose of purity is to be expressed in the way a woman dresses and presents herself in the body of Christ as they're meeting for worship. What she wears and how she presents herself to others is based on a firm conviction and resistance to what the world says is acceptable and fashionable. Her intention will be to dress in a way that reflects the grace and beauty of who she is as a woman, as revealed through her heart. By that I mean she'll not draw attention to herself through revealing clothes. She will not flaunt her physical assets or her beauty to show herself off or attempt to tempt men in a sensual way. Now that's a message that we need to hear today in so many ways because the church has adopted and assimilated the fashions of the world saying they're okay, I'm fine. Paul was saying look you be careful as a Christian woman about what you wear and why you wear it when you come to worship. Now that's challenging because here in the territory it's so warm and hot and women choose to wear the latest fashions that leave nothing to the imagination. What do your clothes reveal about you? What do you want them to reveal about you? Are people drawn to you because of what you wear or because of what you are as a Christian? Does the way you dress, does it bring honour to the Lord and respect for him? An old commentator once said that a Christian woman will pay careful attention to her appearance, making sure she offends no person by her dress. She'll be determined to show that everything she does, from her dress to her speech and her actions, will honour the Lord whom she follows and serves. She will not come to worship to be a distraction to others. She desires to be a godly influence without any desire to flaunt herself before others or to be a stumbling block to others. So Paul in summary is saying, concentrate and think carefully about what you wear and why you are wearing it. Which brings us to carefulness. The adornment must not be with braided hair and gold or pearls or expensive clothing. So really Paul is just saying 
be careful in what you wear and how you wear it and why you wear it. He's not saying, look ladies, as you enter the church, there is a dispenser over there and I want you to put all your gold and jewellery and your fashion accessories into that box so that you will not be a distraction to others. That's not what Paul is saying. I don't think he'd get very far if that's what he tried to please. Now you may be asking yourself, what's the big deal and what's the big issue that's at stake here? In Paul's day, he was having problems with the cultural excess, where the church would try to imitate the latest and greatest fashions that the world was embracing. In other words, the newest fads were taking place in the world at that time were now creeping into the church. And it became an opportunity for women to express themselves in society. It was an opportunity for them to make a statement about themselves through wearing the latest fashions. Look at me, I am somebody. I am with it, I've got it. Now even in our modern culture today, Women are being told that if you've got it, flaunt it, show it off, be proud of what you have, do not keep it hidden, show it off. And that's a message that permeates to the young ones particularly. We know from the records of history that the Roman Empire, this was something that was happening throughout society. And women were encouraged to make these statements even in the Roman courts. This had a flow on effect that filtered from the society's practice of the day where women demonstrated their wealth and opulence through their dress, jewellery and hairstyles. And of course, the church wasn't immune to such influences. In fact, this is what Paul is addressing here as an issue in Ephesus. The issue of those ladies who had begun to initiate those worldly fashions, particularly which embrace sensuality and modesty. And that's a challenge for the modern church today. I mean, it's a challenge and has been a challenge for the church throughout the generations, but more so today. And it's for both men and women. That's a challenge for how men and women dress. How does the way I dress, how does the way that I present myself on Sunday, what does it say about me? What does it say about my relationship to the Lord? And you might think, well, that's got nothing to do. I'm here. I'm worshipping. Well, it does have a, 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 an impact on the way that you present yourself. Because if I walked in with the latest Gucci or whatever, Armani, clothes dressed to the hilt, what would you think of me? No, you wouldn't care. If I was dressed up in a $20,000 suit, what would you think? You idiot. <laughs> if I wore the latest fashions, would you imitate and go out and do the same? Hopefully you wouldn't but it says something about me. How I present myself in worship by what I wear is making a statement about where I am and what my relationship with the Lord is. When I come to worship, who am I worshipping and why? I need to understand I'm coming to the house of God. I'm coming to worship the King of Kings. I'm coming to give him the best that I can why? Because he's worthy of being worshipped because of who he is. Now what I wear says a lot about what I think about him. Now please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying or advocating that every person in the church gets dressed up in formal attire. All ladies, you get your hair done, you wear your ball gowns. You men, you get your tuxes, tuxes out and you come to church. I'm not saying that at all. But we need to try and present ourselves in something that is a little better than what we wear at home. We are coming to the house of the Lord to present 
represent him and to present to him our worship. Doesn't he deserve to be honoured to what we wear as well as what is in our hearts? Our culture here in Darwin makes an impact on the way we do things. We want to be comfortable. Most don't like to get dressing up except for special occasions. But usually what we do, we pay attention to the minimal and convenient because it's less trouble to do so. So whatever I'm in, yep, that'll do, and away we go. We don't think of who we're going to visit. Do my clothes show evidence of self-control, moderation, or does it show excess? Then he goes on in verse 10. A commitment, but with good deeds, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Paul is getting now to the heart of the matter. And really, it's the attitude of a heart. He's been speaking about the outward things that women will wear. Now he's addressing that what comes from the outward appearances is shown from what's within the person themselves. What I wear is an attitude that comes from within. There's nothing wrong with Christian women being attractive and appropriately dressed. It's the right and proper thing to do. The danger is what the world presents as being acceptable and attractive drifts into the areas of the modesty, sensuality and self-centeredness. In other words, hey, it's all about me. Look at me. Look at what I'm wearing. Look at what I've got. Aren't I beautiful? Paul says, if you're a woman who professes faith in Christ, then think again about that. Because when you come to worship, it's not about you. It is concerned about a life of godliness and how to please the one who has done so much for you. And this is a huge problem in modern society today, in our culture, that loves to express sexuality. Do, mi do not misunderstand what I'm saying about sensuality or sexuality. Sexuality is a beautiful thing. Within the context of marriage, the ability of a husband to enjoy the wife and vice versa is one of the greatest privileges that God has given us as men and women. But God did not expect that to be shown and shared with every human being that you pass by in the street. He says you are to be modest and discreet in the way in which you are dressed. There's a right way to dress and there's a wrong way to dress. He's not saying that it's all just subjective and in the eye of the beholder of what's approved. There is a way that a person dresses that sends one message and there's a way that a person can dress that sends another message. It depends on who is looking, what message that they're receiving is what Paul's concerned about. What might be okay for one might not be okay for another. And Paul is saying in this passage, instead of aspiring to be seductive and provocative in the way we dress, let us adorn ourselves instead with a beautiful character and life. Godly women do not desire to draw attention to themselves through the external things they wear. Their desire is to honour Christ through the good works that express godliness in practical and uplifting ways. The ongoing struggle that many Christian women face is to determine what life is and isn't about. There's a fine line between reality and assumption. The scriptures present us with instructions and demands of what God requires that challenges our approach to these issues. For example, we are about to discuss a passage in the next few verses, not tonight, but next week, that actually divides Christians about whether a woman should be allowed to preach in the church. I dare say if I took your opinion, I'd have different opinions. It's a big deal to many women because they claim there is a lack of equality in the church between men and women and that women are being treated unfairly while men have all the privileges. Now personally, 
I don't believe that. But you would say, that's okay, you're a man. You're in that privileged position. But I'll elaborate on that when we continue to go through that passage. But our culture has continued and continues to blur the lines and muddy the waters when it comes to understanding that there'll always be differences, always differences between men and women in their roles and responsibilities. And this applies to the church as well as every other area of society. Always. There are differences. If I put a man and a woman up here, would you see the differences? You wouldn't. I'll get you another pair of glasses. Well, these days it is often hard to tell, or it can be hard to tell. But what I'm saying is there are differences and always will be differences. No matter what our culture says or tries to imply today is by changing the gender. But the question is that we need to ask, what does the Lord see in us? When he looks at us, what does he see? What does he see in men? What does he see in ladies? And what he should see when he looks at the ladies in the church is a beauty that supersedes the externals of what they look like and how they present themselves. Now it's good to look attractive and be well dressed. But you know what? God is more interested in what's in here. That surpasses any of the external things that you may wear. He's interested in what's in here. That's what he's looking for. Now what he sees is this beauty. He sees what he sees in the heart flows from it. The beauty that flows from it is demonstrated by the good works that a godly woman reveals in her work with the Lord. So her walk and her talk are the same. How she dresses reflects about what's in her heart. And I thought this was great because this is from a a godly woman that you can't really argue with. How many know Elizabeth Elliot? Was she a godly woman? Does she have anything to say? I think so. And she said this. I think she said this. Ah, We've gone on the blink. There it is. The fact that I'm a woman does not make me a different kind of Christian. But the fact that I'm a Christian does make me a different kind of woman. Quite a statement, isn't it? I'm different. Why? Because I have God living within me. And he makes a difference. It's good works that provides the biblical basis and God's basis for godliness. He says these women ought to make a claim to being godly by having their hearts adorned or dressed with the right attitudes and the right heart. A godly woman makes a conscious decision to live a life that shows who she worships and follows in a wicked and often evil world. Her desire, her ambition is to live a godly life, not a sexy one by the outward things she does or doesn't wear. This goes against our culture of the day, a culture that's unrelenting, that keeps peddling a philosophy that conflicts with biblical standards of a woman who wants to practice godliness in her life. And this is what you're going to find. Christian women are fighting this and struggling with this all the time. The Bible says one thing, the culture says another, and they have to determine what they're going to follow. The Christian life is one of commitment. Take my life and all I have. I make available to you, Lord, to use and bring glory to your name. That's what we as Christians say. That's what as Christians we should do. So much of our information and influence comes through the movies presented on our TV sets that have subtle appeals to our hearts to embrace the externals without any regard to the internals. And it isn't long before we accept these things as being appropriate. Paul is saying the Christian woman ought to aspire to a beautiful character in life and that we ought to avoid anything 
that is improper and immodest and indiscreet in terms of our clothing. Ask yourself, what is this clothing drawing attention to me about, or drawing about me? Is it making a man look at my face, or is it drawing a man to look somewhere else? And if it is, why do I want a man to look somewhere else, and what will the result be in the way that he looks at me? And those are valid questions that need to be answered. Do you want it to be treated only as a sex object, or do you want to be treated as a person of substance and dignity? The Bible challenges this by saying, don't worry about the externals. Don't allow them to be the focus of who and what you really are. 1 Peter 3, 3, 4 says, let your beauty not be external, the braiding of hair and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes, but the inner person of the heart, the lasting beauty of a gentle and tranquil spirit which is precious in God's sight. This is what God is looking for. This is what he delights in. Now I'm not saying that this is a problem in our church. I'm certainly not preaching it with any particular person in mind. It's challenging all women to be careful in what they wear and be more concerned about living a godly life which the Lord delights in than paying attention to your outward appearance. If a woman makes a profession of godliness, it should be supported by her good works. Now Paul has dealt with a woman's appearance and attitude and activity. Her deed should also demonstrate the profession of godliness which she aspires, aspires to. Next week, we're going to look at the battleground of whether women should be able to preach and teach in the church but Paul is setting it up there was an issue in the church and you'll find that most of the critics say well it doesn't actually say what that issue is but we have the culture I believe that's come in and made a difference and this thing I found that she doesn't follow the crowd she doesn't fit the mold because being like the world is not really her goal her trust is in the Lord and she longs for much more than anything this world could ever have in store. You see, this, there's more to this life and what it has to offer. And that's what a godly woman is looking for. Something that's beyond this world and it's worth it. And she's prepared not to be mixed in the same mold. Her desire is to live a life that pleases the Lord. It's a challenging thought, particularly in our modern society, when we find that women, particularly young women, don't like to be told what to wear. I know. I have a daughter or daughters that don't like to be told.